My son Max and I went dog sledding in the Yukon. Does everybody know where the Yukon is? It's in Canada, right near Alaska. The average temperature was 25 degrees below zero. Max and his dad have done this trip twice before, but my husband had to have neck surgery, so he couldn't do it. He came, but he sat in a cabin, and it was up to me to continue the tradition. And I'll tell you the truth, I thought I might die. <laughs> we spent the first couple days getting to know our gear and our dogs, Oh, I got to know all six of my dogs and their various personalities. In fact, there were 149 dogs in this dog sledding kennel place. And it was a lot like church. So-and-so got along with so-and-so, but you had to put so-and-so in a timeout over here. And yeah, it was very... On Wednesday, we took off into the wilderness where we would camp for two nights and three days. Out there on the rivers, the frozen rivers, there would be moments when I could not see another human soul. When the dogs were pulling smoothly and the beauty was so far beyond my comprehension. I really had never seen anything so vast and so expansive. And at night, the stars would blanket the sky. It took my breath away. And after a snow, there was this peace, this silence that was deafening. And yet somehow gentle at the same time. This earth that God has given us is so very beautiful. And it struck me once again how we must learn to take care of it. Our guide was a man named Jeff who stood about six foot five. He was a role model for me in so many ways. He, he loved the land and he knew everything about it. And he loved the dogs. We had to take care of the dogs before we took care of ourselves. And in that kind of weather, it's hard to do that. Jeff could be funny and he could tell a joke around the campfire. But he also could be mad sometimes. You see, he could only take four of us out on this wilderness trek. Max and I and another couple. And if we did something stupid, he didn't have time to be nice. He would yell at us. If I drove my dogs too close to Max's and they were getting tangled or barking at each other, he'd yell out, Kate, what are you thinking? Get your dogs away from Max's dogs. Pull back, pull back, right now. Are you crazy? And I'd think, oh, whoops. He was harsh and to the point, and angry, but it happened only in bursts and in the spur, spur of the moment. And he was angry because we were dumb, and he was trying to keep us safe. I noticed that he got even more angry at Max than he got at me, because Max was, is a great dog sledder, and I'm a dumb. So it was like he could expect more from Max. I remember when I was 12 years old, my grandparents took me on another adventure that really shaped my life. They took me to, to Europe. We were in London, and my grandmother and grandfather were standing on the curb, and my grandfather wasn't paying attention. And you know how the traffic goes the other way? Well, he stepped right out into it and was almost hit by a car. My grandmother yanked him back on the curb and slapped him in the face. And I remember standing there going, whoa, can that happen? I 
I want to talk with you this morning about a tough subject, a subject that we don't talk about very much and that we don't understand well at all. I want to talk about how Jesus got mad. The gospel that we have today is the quintessential mad Jesus moment. It's the one that we always think about. But Jesus got mad a lot more than just in this one scene. Jesus, if you read the gospels carefully, got mad a lot. He would get mad regularly at the Pharisees and Sadducees who were claiming to be religious and yet being hypocritical and judgmental. He would get mad at the disciples when they fought about who was greater than who. He would get mad at the people and say, you faithless generation, why aren't you listening to me? He got mad at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. And in this gospel passage, it's just after the first miracle in the gospel of John. So Jesus has turned water into wine, and the next thing he does is he goes up to Jerusalem, which is up a hill, because it's the Passover. And at the Passover, as many Jews as could possibly do it, would walk all the way to Jerusalem to make a sacrifice to God. So Jesus was going with some of the most faithful people. And when he arrived, he saw that there was a business going on, more than just a business. The temple authorities were taking advantage of the devout. You see, it was customary to bring an animal to sacrifice to God, but the temple authorities had come up with a great scheme. They referred to a passage in Leviticus which said that you had to bring an animal without blemish. So if you brought an animal from your own farm, they would tell you that the animal had a blemish, so you had to buy theirs. And then their animals were expensive. So they forced pilgrims to buy their product, kind of like when you go to the movies and they don't let you bring food and then the popcorn is $12. But this was in the case of worship. They weren't just taking advantage of anybody doing anything. This was them taking advantage of people who were trying to worship God and charging them money to worship God and telling them that if they didn't buy their product, they weren't worshiping effectively or correctly, that God would not love them as much if they didn't buy their animals. And the second thing that they did was they told everyone that you can't use your regular money in the temple because it has an image of uh, Caesar on it, and that's an idol. So when you get to the temple, you've got to exchange your money. And the temple authorities got some money from Tyre, and when they exchanged it, guess who made a profit? So Jesus walks in, and he looks at all of this, and he realizes that these people are using the faith of others to make money and then it's unjust, and it's wrong, and it makes him mad. And here's where it gets really complicated, because when Jesus gets mad, it's not always pretty. He's not nice. He makes a whip out of cords, and he drives out the cattle and the sheep. Can you imagine the chaos? There are hundreds and hundreds of animals here, all being driven out, And then, to make it worse, he starts throwing the tables over so that the money just goes everywhere. He makes a huge mess. It's not nice at all. It's not polite, and it isn't pretty. So 
So in our culture, generally, I think we are told that we're not supposed to get mad at all. That anger is ugly and that it's wrong. And if you get mad, generally, you're a bad person and you better figure out a way to shove it down or get rid of it somehow. But the scripture tells us that Jesus was without sin. So if Jesus got angry, it's okay for you to get angry too, and for me to get angry. But I don't know about you, I've, been, I've imbued this message so much about anger that what I generally do is if someone mistreats me, I stare at them like a deer in headlights, and then the next day I feel bad and depressed and I do something passive aggressive. <laughs> That's great, huh? Some of us will explode and say things we shouldn't. Some of us will direct our anger not at the one who made us angry, but will tell it to a third person or 5,000 third people. Some of us will just shove it down and feel terrible. So if it's okay to be angry, how can we express our anger in the right way? Well, again, we got to look at Jesus. First of all, Jesus gets angry, kind of like my guide, Jeff. He gets angry because he cares a lot. He gets angry because he loves people and they're doing stupid things. His anger is fueled by love. In fact, love gets mad. If you don't love, you don't care, and you don't get angry. People who get angry generally care about something. And I bet the people you get angry with the most are the people you love the most. Anger, expressed correctly, is a sign of love. And it's a good thing. Back in my first church, I had a senior warden who was drinking himself to death. And when I talked to his wife, she'd say, oh no, I don't want to bother him about it. I don't want to have a fight. So, you know, I just give him his scotch every night. She didn't dare get angry at him because she didn't want a scene. She didn't want to get a divorce. She didn't want a mess. She was more devoted to being nice than she was to telling the truth. That's not love. When Jesus got angry, he got angry because people were doing something offensive or wrong and they weren't being their best selves, and he knew it. His anger called them to something higher, and it was a good thing. So the first thing to ask ourselves is, is this something that I should be angry at? Am I angry because I care, because I love? And if so, then like Jesus, we need to directly address the person we're angry at in the moment, not five days later, not ten years later, not to somebody else. We need to say to the person, I'm really angry at you because this. There's a great book called The One Minute Manager where it tells people how to be a boss and it says if someone does something right, tell them. And if someone does something wrong, tell them. Right then. I think he called it constructive criticism. Motivate people to do their best. Show them that it matters. It's okay that it upsets you. It means you care. I remember in seminary, I had a professor of liturgy. Every class, he was fuming mad. And he would tell us about all the mistakes people made in liturgy. And, oh, I can't believe this priest did this. And, that, and smoke would come out of his ears. He was mad because he loved worship so much. And he wanted it to be done right. And when it doesn't, wasn't done right, it made him very, very frustrated. But it came from a place of great devotion and love. I think each of us has to figure out for ourselves 
how we can most effectively express our anger in a way that is truthful, in a way that is loving, in a way that is direct. We must learn to do this if we are to be fully human, fully alive, and to follow Jesus. So go forth from this place and don't be afraid to get mad. Amen.